Continuing in the, good morning by the way, (laughs) continuing in the spirit of what has been called Father's Day and I think appropriately so as we are so thankful for dads, thankful to be one myself and even of already things that have been said, I want to focus a little bit on one aspect of fatherhood this morning that I think is extremely important and try to do so from God's holy word so that it's really not just my words but it's really God's word. Now when I was 13 or 14 right in there early teenage years sadly and the most important thing to me were my buddies, my cronies that I played ball with and other things and uh, what they thought of me and all that was way up on the chart. And we attended a church that was sadly mostly superficial in the way it brought forth the Word of God. And on Sunday school mornings, the craft of myself and the others in that classroom, and we would gather in the junior high age group, was to distract the teacher into talking about anything and everything from football games and baseball and the latest film or whatever, maybe girls even, who knows, you know. But anything to stay away from the rather uh, watered-down message that was going to be presented anyway. And that was an ongoing thing. Well, one morning, we gathered as usual for Sunday school, and the door opens. We're expecting our regular teacher to come in, and in walks my dad. And, uh, boy, my heart went down in the bottom of my feet because I knew my dad and what he was going to bring, and he did. Boy, he let us have it right between the eyes. There was no distractions that day. He put us on notice that we're on the road to hell and we needed a Savior and what that meant to be saved. I'll never forget that because I have never been so embarrassed in my life. I was just tortured inside. I was tortured from conviction of what he was saying because I knew him and I knew what was right and true at that time, even though I wasn't following it. And I also was embarrassed because he, they all knew who my dad was. Today, I'm incredibly thankful for that. Examples are very important in rearing our children. Examples that cut to the quick, just like the Word of God cuts to the quick. And one of the most sobering issues in theology with all of us is anthropology and how we're born sinners. And with that understanding of our terrible situation in sin is the knowledge of our natural spiritual father. Did you get that? Natural spiritual father. Father, we know, for example, from John 8, 44, where the Lord Jesus, when he was talking to the religious people of the day, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. In Matthew, I'm not getting you to turn there. The Lord Jesus in the parable of the wheat and the tares, he says this in Matthew 13, 38. And the field is the world, and as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. Now what I'm trying to get across, and this is stated any number of times in the New Testaments, it's stated in Acts 13, 10, it's stated in 1 John 3, 12, in addition to what what I've already stated, that we are naturally born not with God as our Father. We are born sinners. And our spiritual Father is the evil one. And therefore we can take no comfort in God just because He's our Creator. Because we are born in sin and have naturally Satan as our Father, our spiritual father, 
And that explains, of course, so much of who we are and the activity of the day in which we live, which is very similar to Genesis 6, where every thought and intention of man's heart was on evil continually. And what we need, of course, is a true Savior, one who transfers us into the kingdom of our God, an amazing family transfer from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And what we want in finding that Savior, one of the most important people in our life, is fathers. And fathers ought to be a big old signboard in their life that are constantly pointing to Jesus Christ. Because there's not an issue more important than that, is there? Not an issue more important than that. Let me ask the Lord to bless our time as we look into God's Word together about examples, please. Father, we thank you for dads today. We thank you. Especially we think of God-fearing men that lead their families and follow your true holy word and love you and, Father, desire to please you and help others to know you, especially their children and their family, and to lead them, as Joshua said of old, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, bless us today as we just think on these things and that we might cut the curtain away of all the other things that are going on and just think in terms of a right relationship with you which is so important and whether that relationship does not yet exist or whether we just need to be rethinking ourselves and what we're putting before us as priorities. I pray that you'd bless this time together, that you'd honor your holy word, Father, and you'd help me to speak and help us all to hear from your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Something uh, wonderful about parent-child relationship, special and influential, and, and it, I know as a, as a small child, I thought my dad was a, a big man. My, I thought he must be stronger than other men, and, and he was just, as, just so big to me and so powerful. And then as I grew up, it was funny to me. He is physically kept shrinking in size. I don't know how that occurred, but it, it did. But God doesn't ever shrink. The more we know of him, the bigger he gets. The more glorious he gets. He never shrinks. And so the most important purpose for any dad is not about puffing themselves up in any sense of the word, but it's about, again, pointing their children to God, the Holy God, Jesus Christ, His Son. And to be an example of that, that that's the most important thing in the world, is our relation to Jesus Christ, to the God the Father through the Son. And Dad, who your spiritual father is, will be the basis of how you reflect him and how you point to him. Now I want to begin in Ephesians chapter 6, a very important little passage, and you know the second half of Ephesians is about our walk of faith. And in Ephesians 6, 4, we have right in the middle of this challenging text about the spiritual warfare, we have the statement, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There, this is so powerful a statement, so wonderful a statement. To unpack it is, in, a, in a brief is, is not appropriate, but that's what i got to try to do. There are three admonitions of powerful importance in this verse. A verse that shows wise contrast in parenthood, and particularly upon fathers as the head of the house. Provoke here is the word 
paragizo, which means to cause anger and frustration or anger from frustration, and, it, and suggest an ongoing pattern of treatment gradually building deep-seated antagonistic anger in a child. Now, any kind of imbalance in child rearing may cause such provoking from overprotection to overcorrection to undercorrection from neglect or favoritism of one child over another or being too harsh or pushing overachievement that is never enough or just plain old neglect. In fact, I read that the number one cause for children being placed in foster homes is disinterest by the parents or neglect. In so many ways, it is another form of abortion, if you think about it, after they're born. To mistreat a child, to kill their spirit, to push them down, to provoke them to anger, and this type of antagonism is an ugly, ugly thing that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And of course, in today's wicked society, there's all manner of unspeakable child abuse, both physical and verbal. Such abuse reduces children to being treated as trash, unwanted, unimportant, and certainly unloved. Of course, these little ones, and we know this from the Bible, but it ought to be common sense, are a gift from God. And they should be seen as the greatest of treasure. And so important. Christ himself, you know that he spoke of this in, in Matthew 19 when, when the, the, the people were trying to keep the children from coming to the Lord Jesus. And he said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Amen. He loved little children. And he set the example that we should love little children. In our text, again, in Ephesians 6, 4, he also says the opposite of this provoking, but he says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline is referring to consistent, systematic training, a right balance Aside from provoking is attention to consistent, meaningful correction and praise. Such understands the little person is a sinner who needs attention with truth boundaries, with an atmosphere of love, grace, and compassion that all speaks of how God treats us in His long-suffering kindness and endurance with us. Instruction is a different word having to do with teaching and correction, not facts, but its real intention and its real focus is upon the heart and right attitudes leading to righteous behavior. For the Word of God is always dealing more with the heart, leading to whatever we might think of as the externals. And that is what is needed, is a changed heart. And he says in all of this, Ephesians 6, 4, instruction of the Lord. Of the Lord. In other words, according to God's Word. According to what God has revealed of Himself. God the Father as an example to us, as was already mentioned this morning. And He is to be immolated. And Christ stated what? We are to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy. Christ Himself stated when He was washing the feet of the disciples that I give you an example, I give you an example that you should do as I have done. Paul Himself states repeatedly as an apostle set apart by God, we think of 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, where he talks about be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow me, in other words. Follow my example in our scripture reading 
that I had us do on Philippians 3. He's talking about follow my example. And all of us in Christ Jesus, to one degree or another, ought to be able to say to our children and to others, if we're following Christ, follow my example. Never pull off the shenanigan that Glenn was talking about in Sunday school in Matthew 23 of the woes that Christ gave to the Pharisees that they would tell people not to, to, do, to do what they say, but not to do what they did, actually, for they were hypocrites. They were hypocrites. And think to, with me, please, of the role models in our society. Think of the role models that you see on the television. Think of the role models coming out of Hollywood. Think of the role models in the uh, athletic community. Can you hang your hat on hardly anybody? Uh, every once in a while a Tim Tebow comes along or something. But it is ex extremely rare. Sadly, their focus is in the wrong place. And they're leading people astray. When we read of, by contrast, our chief example is God the Father, our real example. And let me get us to just think for a minute without turning there to Isaiah chapter 6. Remember how Isaiah saw that vision of God on the throne and this amazing picture that nobody can even understand exactly what it is. But he sees this picture of God on his throne and the angels above him crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And what does Isaiah do? He cries out humbly, Woe is me! I'm undone. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now you see, really when we understand or be, even begin to understand who God is and the fear of the Lord, which is the, the beginning of wisdom, we all have that same response. If we don't have that response, then we've got it all wrong in ourselves. So when we're talking about emulating God we're not talking about trying to replace God. How ridiculous. But we are trying to please Him because we see Him for who He is. And we recognize the commands of Scripture. Now, I think you know that in John chapter 1, there is that statement where we read that He came to His own, speaking of Christ. And his own received him not. And such he did. He came to the Jews. And a very few of the Jews received him. The most of them would cry out, crucify him. He came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave, notice carefully, the right to become children of God. Do you recognize the power of and beauty of who in Jesus Christ we are as children of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, and if you want to turn there, I'll, I'll let you, we have this beautiful picture that Paul portrays of the work of the three members of the Godhead in salvation that began before time began and what God is doing and bringing a people to himself. And when we get to verse 5, he says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Adopted as sons. We assume the family name. We assume the same privileges as blood kin in all legal, social aspects, members of his household, even heirs of him. We are 
called by God himself, the sons of God. Hallelujah. And so we will be, by the way, in eternity future. That's eternal life with him. Glorification in his presence. Now, all of that being true, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're a son of God, a daughter of God, right now. And the whole admonition here is, in relation to that, is if that be so, are we acting like sons of God? Are we living like sons of God? Are we thinking like sons of God? Are we following His example in all that we do? Turn back to Matthew chapter 5 for a moment. And you know, right in the midst of this wonderful Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Christ is talking about relationships with others, even our enemies, and how we ought to love them, and how we ought to be patient and enduring, and all of those kinds of things. Why? Because of who we are. Because that's the way God is. That's what He's talking about. The Lord allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, doesn't He? Now, there's coming a reckoning day, but in the meantime, the Lord is gracious and patient and enduring and loving. And when he gets to the end of this, he says in verse, chapter 5, verse 48, Therefore you, and that you there, is referring to the sons of God. Therefore you. In fact, if you look back at Verse 45, before we get to 48, he says, So that you may be what? Sons of your Father who is in heaven. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. He says in verse 48, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now he's not saying here that we can attain perfection in this life. But that's our goal. That's our goal. That's our seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And that's what I want us to really think about today, and especially as our focus is on fathers. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, where we have this very important chapter. In fact, I preached on this at the fire conference with other brethren. Romans chapter 8 is about being led by the Spirit of God. And you look at verse 14. Notice, jumping in here. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Led by the Spirit, supernaturally. And notice the close, intimate relationship that also follows here. He says, if, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, there we are again, by which we cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. This is a bond of inconceivable love. A relation so special, so close to God. We speak to Him in the most intimate terms. And this is to be contrasted back in Romans 7, 24, in the same real context, where you have this fellow crying out, and I think Paul is playing a role there, crying out, Oh, wretched man that I am! Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will set me free from this body of death? Look at the contrast with that, of those being led by the Spirit, calling out, Abba, Daddy, Father to the God of the universe. And he says in verse 15, For you, that is those who are being led by the Spirit, have not received a spirit of slavery to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, Abba, Father. This is a new glorious relationship. 
designed by God. And this true, the truly saved are not just people therefore promised heaven someday. They are new creations, loved of God with a particular love, and are being transformed and are destined for an eternal glory and perfection in a union of love with their Father, the God of all glory. So this is very, very special. Keep your finger here, please, and turn over to 1 John chapter 5. I hope you know that 1 John is a book that really defines our relationship with God, whether it's a true relationship or just one that we would presume to be a relationship. But it, it identifies who is of God and who is not of God. And when we get to chapter 5, John is making some summaries here of what, it, what a true Christian is like. And all of this is associated with our conversation about being led by the Spirit and about being sons of God and being an example. Look at chapter 5 and verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Now right there are two of the big issues of true relationship with God. What are they? He mentions them here. Love and obedience. Love and obedience. And he says here, we observe His commandments, and he says in verse 3, that His commandments are not burdensome. In other words, Christ talks about the Pharisees and that they bundle up these huge burdens upon people's backs with all these 613 rules for them to follow. But the true Christian who is changed of heart inside, the, the, the words of God, the commandments of God, the commandments of Scripture that God truly gives, not the stuff that the Pharisees made up in conjunction with it, but what God truly gives, they're not burdensome. They want to do them. Because their heart is changed and they want to honor their Father. They want their light to shine. And then we, he also adds in, in, in this same context, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And you notice that phrase, overcomes the world. That is significant. I started with talking about my dad coming into that Sunday school classroom. My dad didn't really care what my cronies thought, didn't care what I thought. He was there to honor God. He, I'm sure he cared about me. I thank God he did. He cared enough about me and them to tell us the truth. Overcomes the world. And he says, and who is it that overcomes the world but he, in verse 5, who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. They have a, an exalted view of Christ. An exalted view of Christ. Christ is lifted up in their life, in their thinking, in their priorities and everything else. And so that's the third piece there. You have love, you have obedience, and you have faith. Belief. Faith that all of this is transforming activity or really is the result of transforming activity, love, <coughs> obedience, and faith. And so, going back to our text in Romans chapter 8, we see in verse 16, he says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's a sanctified, uniting work in all belonging to Christ. There is a spiritual instinct made by the indwelling Spirit of God with our inner self such that this is a new sense of desires, a new love of God, a new affection for His Word, a new affection for Christ, a new priority of everything else in our life. And it changes everything so that now, Dad, you emulate not perfectly, but that's your desire. You emulate 
and be pleasing to your heavenly Father, recognizing your children for who they are, naturally the children of the devil, naturally that need a transference into the kingdom of Christ, and your desire is that they might know Him. There's no greater desire than that. Everything else is missing the mark. And it changes everything. So that, now dad, you want them to see Christ in you. You want them to see Christ in you. And there's nothing better for dads than for their children to see Christ in them. And so I want you to turn to Philippians 3, what we had in our reading today, because here Paul in Philippians 3, tells us so very much, but in part of that telling, he is talking here about being an example to follow. Now, he's not talking specifically to fathers. He's really talking to all of us. But the father role, I, I, it, it, you know, it can be argued that, that the mother role or the father role is, has the biggest import. I don't know. But I know the father is the head of the house. And if anybody is going to set the tone like Joshua did, my house will serve the Lord, it needs to be dads that have some broad shoulders and are more concerned about Christ than they are about anything else. Now, Philippians 3, beginning in verse 17, he says, Brethren, join in following my example, there it is, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. In other words, anybody that is following or having a similar example as the example that I am giving out before you, follow those people. Now, all of us follow people in our life. We emulate people. We, we think in terms of so-and-so. You know, you, years ago it was, I want to be like Mike, you know, or the basketball player. Well, that's okay, but it would be much better to be like Christ. And follow those that will point you to Christ. He says, follow my example. And what is that example? Look back in verse 8. Here's the attitude of Paul. And so much of this is based on attitude. He says more than that, he's talking about in verse 7 about all these things that as a religious man that were gained to him that he counts loss. It's just a bunch of trash. He says more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. By the way, that's a very, very true statement. He's not just having an emotional binge here. Did you know that everything is trash by comparison to knowing Christ Jesus? And it ought to be considered trash. If it gets in the way of your relationship with Christ, get rid of it. That's what Christ was talking about in that Sermon on the Mount when He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. Get rid of anything that would keep you from a right and good and wholesome, glorious relationship with Jesus Christ. Get rid of it. Now, what is this? In Philippians, it's an attitude, isn't it? It's an attitude. The utmost importance of Paul is seen in verse 9 when he says, and, I, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that, from, uh, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. To be found in Him is what He wants to do. And we see in verse 10, He projects what? That I may know Him. That's His goal. That I may know Him and the Daddy... All the daddies here say, that's not just for themselves. 
They want that for their children, don't they? That my children may know him. That my children may know him. I don't care what else happens if my children may know him. Because everything else, by comparison, is rubbish because this is so valuable. And so he even goes into talking here about the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. He's talking about all of these things as necessary as part of the walk with God and knowing him. And they sound terrible to the natural person that says, well, wait a minute, fellowship of suffering? I don't want that. If you're suffering in there because of your relationship with Christ, oh, there's nothing better. That's a glorious thing. And the, uh, and the power of God working by the Spirit in you that brought the resurrection from the dead, all of that is so wonderful. And being conformed to His death is dying to self. It's like what John the Baptist said and questioned about Jealousy over Christ, and he said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's the same attitude. That's the attitude of, of Paul here. And so back in verse 17, when he says, follow my example, that's, in other words, be like me. And the question that all of us have to ask is, do our kids see this in us? Do they understand our real attitude of life and where we stand in Christ? And not only that, but he says, observe those who walk according to this pattern. These are examples to emulate. And this idea of pattern is impression or type or example. It has to do with the idea of the trend of the person's life. In other words, there's bumps all along the road there. We're all got warts and molds on us. But is the trend of my life always pointing to Christ as most important, as clearly not with hypocrisy or distraction, but clarity. Are we leaving that kind of mark that our children and others would see? And I would say to dads that we have the greatest opportunity to do the words of Christ that let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Because you have such an ability to impress. Such an ability. And he goes on to say in verse 18 of Philippians 3, For many walk of whom I have told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Paul steps aside momentarily and gives a contrast of bad examples. And he does so grievingly. That's what he says here. He says this weeping. He's, he's talking here about not just the people of the world, but he's talking in particular about those that have had a relationship in some sense with the church and with the truth of God, and yet it just really hasn't changed them as they ought to be changed, and they're still toying around in such a divided sense of the word, serving God and mammon or whatever, that their heart is not purely upon Christ and their focus is not entirely upon Him where it needs to be. And he's saying, don't follow those kinds of examples. There's a lot of those, I'm afraid, in the church. And he's not talking here about perfection, for you know back up in verses 12 and 13, he talks about, he says, not that I've already obtained, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. This is, a, this is an attitude of pressing on. And that pressing on, that word, has with it and carries with it that there's a whole lot of resistance. There's a whole lot of things hanging on. And yet Paul says, I don't care what's hanging on. I'm pressing on. I'm going to press on to the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, that I may know Him. Him. 
That's the example that we want to see. That's the example that makes all the difference. As we're talking about daddies today, and we don't have to guess what all this is about because he tells us, by the way, in verse 15, he says, let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. And then he says, and if it anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. In other words, God can straighten you out and iron you out, and you don't want that to happen, by the way. He has a way of correcting his own doesn't he? But he's talking here about attitude, isn't he? Attitude's a big deal. We're always obnoxious children one way or the other, right? But if our attitude is right, if our attitude, if our heart is right, it's just like our children. Our children make mistakes. But if their heart is right, if their attitude is right, oh, that means so much. It's not the mistakes they make. When their attitude is right, we, we cherish that. And, and such it is here in our relationship to God. And he's talking about looking at those that have the attitude of Christ first, of God first, God number one in all the priorities of my life. And that is seen in how I walk and how I live and how I think. And so we ask ourselves, Dads, really everybody, what are we living for? Our goals and our ambitions, the real us. What do others see in us? What kind of an example are we leaving for them? MacArthur in his, one of his writings records the confession of a father, a dad. And it goes, it goes like this. I'm reading it. He said, my family is all grown up and my kids are all gone. But if I had it to do all over again, this is what I would do. Have, have you ever had that, dads? And I'm an old guy, you know, and I've said the same things. I, I could almost write this myself. This is what I would do. He said, and he lists spending more time with his family and showing love and being less interested in things and more interested in them and but then most importantly and finally at the bottom line he says if I had it to do all over again I would share God more intimately with my family ever every ordinary thing that happened in our life and there were many things along the way and all of these ordinary things of an ordinary day, I would use those ordinary things to direct them always to God. Honey, God is in this. Son, God is in this. Precious daughter, God is in this. God is in these problems. God is in this trial. God is in everything. God is the one to get the glory. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. And ironically, we only have one shot, one opportunity with our families, and for that matter, with other people around us. But we're never too old, even to start today, for that matter, even if you're as old as me. We're never too old to start showing others Jesus Christ because that's what it's really about. Let me pray in closing for all of our examples, closing of this time in God's Word. Father, we thank you for families. We thank you for how you have structured them to Give each one of us roles and positions and these places that are so important. We pray, Father, that you'd help us, oh Lord. Help us to be the, the dads and the mothers and 
that we ought to be in everything that we do, that we might point to your lovely Son, the Lord Jesus. Father, that we might apply Scripture in all things, that we might serve you with a whole heart, that they might see our attitude towards you as what matters to us more than anything in this world. I pray your help, your mercy upon us all today. And Father, where there are those that know thee not, I pray you'd work in hearts. That they might be changed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom from Satan into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That they might be adopted sons and daughters of the true and the living God. Oh, nothing better, nothing more wonderful, nothing compares. Father, bless our continued worship as we reflect on the Lord's table and use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.